And who sang out on there is live. It's funny because Steve Mann, Professor Steve Mann, calls these the gallows, the hangings. <laughs> we get the opportunity to hang ourselves. Hi, Bruce, how are you going there? I'm good, mate. How are you? Great. Very good. So this last week or so, uh, since we last spoke, has um, been a, a fairly busy one for us both. Um, <clears throat> what's come to my awareness in the last short period of time is that major companies such as Rare Tinto and others, and they'll get that keyword because everything's drilled, of course, um, a lot of their mine sites are now going fully automatic, meaning that those big haul trucks that used to be haul packs that used to have drivers in them, human drivers, and some of those conveyor loaders down downstairs, you know, 1.25 k's under the ground, and all of those, all that sort of supposed income that's coming back in from the FIFO industry. Well, recently, even up in Orange and Cadia Mine and others, all that's starting to actually disappear, and those workers are losing all their contracts and their jobs completely because the haul packs are now being driven automatically. There's no humans in them; they're all driven by sensor-based systems odometry and LIDAR and all GPS, underground. And so what's happening is that all of that income that used to come back to the local economy has disappeared as well. Which means, of course, as the consortia mining companies claim, uh, better dividends, higher profits, more shares to the shareholders, more, more dividends to the shareholders. And essentially, it means that we're no longer facing any national-based issue in relation to mining and the setup of any of these uh, plants for nuclear and other, what we're actually starting to see is a complete automation of the way that these structures are created in the first place. So very, very few people, very few humans are actually involved in the actual creation of the holes and tunnels. A lot of it's to do with machinery that's fully automatic and that ore is transported out of those holes and changed and moved around and the stuff that's put in there as well is automatic. And the frightening part about it is, is that and I've got lots of reports around a little short paper I'll connect to this hangout. And that is that um, the people that are controlling them are not up in a donger up, up on the surface of the, of the ground upstairs. They're 1,200 kilometres away down in Perth. And there's even talk of that actually being, it could be over in the UK or China or Korea. But the controllers are over there in their boardrooms and the workers are in the same building operating automatic machinery back here in Australia. And the whole lot's being colonised by these automatic uh, haul packs and diggers and all the rest of them. So we're facing a new. It's a very. I think it's a very new. A new threat, as facilitated by artificial intelligence, automation systems, uh, for this this industry, and um, that has a has huge social and socio-ethical implications. I think, not only on. Not only on the townships that used to depend on the FIFOs being around, not just that, the fact that you can't even, there's no more negotiation with anybody on the ground about any of this stuff. It's completely gone, completely and utterly international. And, uh, and therein lies um, part of our mission, isn't it, Bruce? So I'm coming your way with Maley, uh and we're looking forward to coming and listening to you, what's happening your way. Well, that's 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 funny, isn't it? Eh? you you um, white fellas have finally caught us to up mob. You know, <laughs> all of those jobs that you're talking about, uh, we we don't even get a, a swing at usually. And when we do, it doesn't take much more than an iron ore price to kick us out as the uh, most trained and and first last in first out. So the numbers true, on true. Uh, the churn in our Aboriginal staff for starters uh, are horrendous. You know. It's welfare of another basis. Um, it will be automated. We we won't get those jobs, and we're basically renting our our country either for a a, a mine um, that we don't we don't possess the the intestinal fortitude as a country to say that you know country is is deeper than the top six inches, and we should have respect for how that's used. Um, it seems as soon as there's an opportunity for a mine or um, uh, we're not allowed to call it a, a waste dump anymore it's a storage facility storage I mean they're manipulating the language yeah, yeah. They're, they're manipulating the language here already um, and let's call it a waste dump if, it, if uh, 
if it wasn't so bad, everyone had wanted it in their backyard internationally. So the message that I'm hearing from our people is that we don't want the international products. It disturbs us that we have to store some of this waste in our country and and um, really it's another TN jam run. It's another opportunity for um, beads and trinkets to be traded for significant say of a country and it's not right, it's not on. Um, mainstream Australia wouldn't allow their own backyards to be sold that way and uh, we won't allow our backyards to be sold that way as well. It's just crazy. Um, it is. I, I'm a, you know, a person who is, has strong ties to country but and often under the legislative process are dispossessed from that. And how dare uh, a non-Aboriginal neighbour who's acquired the land either illegally if they can come to that or at least unethically the way this country was settled and then sell the mining rights or sell the nuclear waste depository rights under our noses. I mean, our, our people in Aboriginal people in South Australia have a strong voice and a strong regard for how to care for country and, and burying someone else's rubbish in your backyard is not, not the way to do it. Um, we have a strong push here in South Australia at the moment to to be well versed and understand the nuclear discussion and the risks involved. Mm -hmm. But they're not fair and balanced and they're not giving us discussion about the green opportunities and at the same time they're removing funding from active communities both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal communities. So everyone should be worried about this. Everyone should be concerned about the way that the policy is being rolled out and that only one side of the story is being told. We, we as Aboriginal people can't and won't be misrepresented. We don't want this product. We want to tell the manufacturers of this product internationally that it's not welcome. And then if they bring it onto our country, mm. that there's an accountability statement that comes with that. So it's a quite an awkward position to be in when other people are speaking for your country. It is Bruce. It's Bruce that is a um, Yeah, that's the front door, on Jeff. That, <laughs> on that note, I um, picked up a very glossy brochure um, last night and I flicked through it and it was from a mining company, a very, very uh, big one. And uh, it's a very, very big report, uh, and it um, it contains some contains some absolutely incredible from from, uh, from Aboriginal um, um, members of the community who now have professorship status in Australia, and in relation to their status to be to be plugged in the middle of a mining dock. Um, Part of the actual statements that are in that document include mining offers many indigenous populations a significant source of employment and contracting opportunities, as well as an alternative to the welfare transfers upon which many remote and regional Aboriginal communities depend. Uh, where have we heard that before? So what we're getting here is that's in the mining context. Okay, so if we think in order to get the waste in the hole, because no longer is it a dump, it's a waste transfer or a storage facility. In order to actually get the waste in there, they have to mine it out, don't they? Okay, so therefore, if, if you haven't been consulted as to what it is that's actually going on the ground in your own country, from another nation who's taken it away from you in the first place, would you think that it's actually then a fair and reasonable context for the same mining company that supposedly owns the com owns the land to then sublease it back to you in order for you to benefit from the waste that they've put on the ground under your own ac water aquifer? So sort of mirroring your com comments there, Bruce, around um, this dispossession of land and dispossession of your, your own self pop people who are not welcome to put their waste in that hole. Now, what happens, Bruce, when some people, as I've had on, I mean, I, that post I put up in Facebook got 5,000 and a half um, likes and shares and whatever, and I got some vile hate mail, vile hate mail. I got some, I got some doozies in there from, you know, we're going to neck you to, we're going to, you know, got some really nasty shit in there. And one bloke comes in there quite, you know, quite the thing and says, Alex, just so happens that we are a nuclear waste producing country nuclear, uh, you know, one of them, 
have their liquor sites. And the waste that they want to put in the hole in Adelaide is nothing to do with Japan or nothing to do with Korea or China or the UK or it's got nothing to do with the 50 um, nuclear plants in France. They want to get the waste in here either. None of that. All they want to do, Alex, is put a little bit, just a little bit of medical waste under the ground there in a very inert area under the Flinders Ranges and out from there, up the way, up the way, you know, just up the way. And um, that it's going to be, it'll be of great benefit to the community. And that's from a, well, I hope so, I hope a law-abiding Australian citizen, largely highly uneducated as to what's actually going to go in those holes. As I predict, in 30 years' time, we'll get another apology. Sorry we fucked up about all the stuff we put in the hole that we said we weren't going to do in the first place that affected everybody in that community that would dispossess them from the land they had in the first place as well. And so these dystopic sort of scenarios go on. So what I'm doing here, Bruce, is I'm, I'm connecting the role of the faceless international consortia that are contributing towards this dispossession of lands in our environment. And what that means is by this technologically facilitated dispossession. It used to be a national-based dispossession where the mining company occupied the country. They dug the fuck out of the hole and fracked everything up. And then they largely took all their spoils away and did something with it. They went and invested in the Cayman Islands or whatever. Now, we've got an international consortia from over there sitting in their own ivory towers with their own virtual controllers operating remote machinery to mine the land on this country and then bury their waste in that hole. So, you know, if you drew a simple sort of schematic um, diagram, I think it's a, it's a rather, as you say there, I'm connecting into my, your, your, your reasoning there, this is actually an international problem. This is not a national agenda. This is well, an international issue. What, what, what we need to say to those people with the international products, and yes, we do have a, an industry here, and that doesn't mean we agree with what we're doing. We don't want their products. We have a choice. We don't need to do this. Our people are saying, as Aboriginal people, we, why are we being forced into a one decision process? And surely there must be a better way. It's always on country that seems to be on, you know, this 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 country's still in dispute about, you know, the, the, where, where this is proposed in South Australia is traditional strong lands of the Adyamatna people, and they have a strong voice around this, which is being um, muchly ignored. And, and they're the people that need a stronger voice. Um, the strong women of the Honourable Pitinjara Yonkinjara lands who, who stood up against um, the nuclear waste dumps in, in prior discussions were, were extremely strong, and much of those women now have passed. And it's disrespectful for us as people in the younger generation not to acknowledge that those people have now passed on and successfully beaten this and, and the, yet the discussion comes back. So aren't they listening? Aren't they, uh, don't they respect what's been said in the past? This is, this is a conversation I'm only sharing. It's not one that I'm driving. This is the voice of country and this is the voice of the people on country saying to those international people, we, we don't want it. And if you do bring it, there's an accountability statement that you must be held accountable because we are telling you early on in the piece that it is not welcome here. We do have to keep and maintain our own backyard, but the processes of accountability around some of this technology, when we don't know. And, and to try and bluff us into the conversation that we've only got one choice makes it even even you know more abhorrent. So let's, let's at least listen to the people who have been on this country the longest period of time. They're the First Nations people. Much of the country is now back in their possession, yet we still don't have say for what goes on in our country. Now, mm. would mainstream Australia accept that? Yet yeah, we're supposed to put up with that. So if, if they want to sell the bottom six inches out from underneath us, we have a strong opinion about that because we are not given any say about what happens on our country other than the top six inches. We're allowed to move back on it. We're allowed to have some access and limited access. And, and, in, and there are good programs that help us revitalise country. But as soon as some of this comes along, this inert business of which we're not involved in, we don't have any say. Our people are standing up strong. They're standing up across the nation. And in South Australia, they are welcoming the opportunity to have a voice 
not nationally, but internationally, to say that the products that are being peddled and, and to be misrepresented to say we want those products is a corrupt conversation. And let's bring some ethical response to the conversation. Let's try and make it as honest as we can in this dirty world. They're caught in conversation. Um, you know, we've got ancestors who have died on this topic, who have fought all their lives about access to country, and now we want to sell it out from underneath ourselves for tea and jam money, for trinkets. Look, people are not going to get the jobs. For Aboriginal people, this is a welfare in disguise. If you put a tuxedo on a goat, it's still a goat. You know, look, people, wake up and just understand that they're not giving us any more than what is our right trade off our backyard for it. Mm -hmm. True, Bruce. And, and so what I um, ask of you and, and, and ask of the wider public too that will watch this, why do we still have people who are part of a supposed royalty set we talk of ethics, who are part of large universities and other structures who facilitate the mining um, boom and bust, who are sold out to these companies and who are in within, within their own capacity, um, then take the advantage of this local situation. And as I wrote in this thing here, it's not by choice that Aboriginal communities you know, dependent on government welfare handouts and never were. That was never a choice. And nor being made dependent on the mining sector, that was no fucking choice whatsoever. And now we have to question whether Aboriginal communities have a choice in what the automation, artificial intelligence and this, cons this international consortia, were you given the choice about that as well? And the answer is clearly no. The answer is clearly no. What I'm very concerned about is the ethical practices of supposed um, community members who know this uh, information that you're talking about, Bruce, who go against what you're saying, largely for their own pursuits of their own um, nice houses and then nice cars and all the rest of it, in, co in collaboration with these mining companies, who say it will benefit our community by... Cons by um, associating with these international consortia and, and it doesn't matter if they bury their waste in, in here as long as we get some benefit over there. What do we say to those people who I think are acting without any ethic whatsoever or any consideration for the past and certainly with no respect for the, for the elders that, that you speak of? Well, you know, there's, those people who have, this is a democracy and they have a right, but don't overvalue or overstate the right to to speak for country, you know. There are rules about how you engage with country and how you show respect and, and uh, having a small percentage of the population agreeing to such wide diversity of use. Uh, I mean, in an urban area, you can't even build a two-storey building without getting 37 planning operations, yet we can have a nuclear waste facility, a dump, a storage a facility which we are known um, we've got a one-way marketing program paid by tax dollars saying you have to be informed about nuclear. Well, you know, per capita, we've got the most wind farms in, in Australia. Why are we even entertaining such a divisive product when we can we can strand forward? The jobs are not there for Aboriginal people. That's why I welcome Alex, you, all them Canberra what for any, you know, because this affects them as much as it affects us because they're the ones that are going to miss out on their jobs in automation. The, the, the small percentage of Aboriginal jobs in the, in the mining sector are irrelevant. The small amount of money on the table being offered for a regional community is a dead cop-out for governments that don't want to fund regional communities. They all want us to live in urban areas and that only suits a small or a, 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 a bit of the population. Australia was built on the diversity of regional communities. So, you know, this policy about selling our country and selling our backyards to do these things so we can survive is, is Robin Peter to pay Paul. Don't educate Aboriginal people if you don't want a strong opinion about this. You know, we've done the cycle. We've now been in the cycle of education for 100 years. There are many more people much wiser than I who are kicking up about this. Mm -hmm. But what I don't like is the one way, the one voice 
that our local media p portray and the government seems to all pull into line that this is a good thing. Um, send a message through your networks internationally to the people who make these products that they're not welcome here. They're not a positive thing for a community. We should be proud that our community has hundreds of thousands of Ks that are diverse and we don't pockets like the rest of the world. This is an abuse of status and the status has been acquired inappropriately. They don't have the right to make these decisions. Well, I can't even make these decisions about my own country because it would impact on my children's ability to have country. So mm. I can't understand how these people can, uh, you know, we're not even in the constitution. We have these recognised and other processes which I support, but they're only half assed They're only minimum based. They shoot low, they aim low, they give our people low return. We still have the highest product and health outcome. We still have the highest unemployment. This is going to fix none of those. And I ask every Aboriginal person who walks on country, who talks for country, who's generally got the backing of their communities to stand up and say, tell these United Nation companies that their products are not welcome. We, we have a choice. Mm -hmm. We as First Nations people have a choice to say no. And and why can't we? Why, why am I disrespect, disrespecting the process by simply having a strong opinion that burying nuclear waste in my country's backyard is not the soft option? It is hardcore. It is devastating to communities who have to deal with it for hundreds of thousands of years. Now, we're presuming that those hundreds of thousands of years are always perfect and <laughs> nothing goes wrong. And every nuclear event around the world wouldn't have happened in a perfect world. But guess what? When they happen, it's because the shit's hitting the fan and there's earthquakes and there's tsunamis and there's tornadoes, yeah. there's wars. We, we haven't even figured out a way to stop blowing each other's up, you know, yeah. like before we That's want to true. put nuclear waste in our backyard. So well, I'm, I'm getting strong support. Yeah, go ahead. I'm getting strong support from Aboriginal people who have had enough, who are tired of a one-way conversation. And all they want to view, Alex, and your people is to come together so that they can say to the world how they feel. Because we're feeling that we have, have uh, it's one-way traffic. That's all, you know. And with this technical age, we should be able to grasp the technology and say that sometimes what everyone is saying if you say it enough, it doesn't make it right. True. Yeah, well, Bruce, I'm adding to the government policy, and I'm adding to the media um, misinformation. I'm adding to that in terms of the ethical domain, those individuals who know who they are, who are contributing to not protecting country from every community, and for those um, people, those humans, to really look and listen carefully to what you were saying around how do you protect country? How do you how do you speak for country if you are? Most importantly, if you think for a moment that actually plugging up a hole with a six metre thick concrete plug with every known UN and every other language um, inscribed on that saying, keep the fuck away from this hole because it will keep you um, fried for the next 100,000 years, seriously, how do you think that's going to affect the ground and the, and the communities around that uh, for the next 200 years, never mind the next 100,000 years. There's absolutely no um, no capacity to actually plan in Western science for 100,000 years ahead. Alex, can I share with you a story? Go ahead. About the people around the Maralinga lands mm -hmm. who have experienced and lived this and they're not even asked, and they should be the first people we ask, and I'll take you to those people. Well, that's and what we're they heading to, are the first, they, should, they should be the first people we ask because when they cleaned up Maralinga, they said it was world's best practice, and guess what? Only a few generations after, not even two, we figured out that it was just Mickey Mouse. It is not world's best practice. Whatever we were told then is all lies, and mm -hmm. now Maralinga glows in the night from the radiation that peels off of it and it's it, no one goes there the practice of how they sealed that up was it's just ridiculous when you look at it now so you know if people want to believe the manufacturers of cds when they said they will last forever and 
within one lifetime you've thrown out your whole collection because they are years because the technology isn't tested. Correct. This is the same conversation we're having. You know, the technology the technolo we're talking about the, here is a destruction. It can't be proven because we haven't lived that long. You know, That's let's it. just not have it here if it is a dump. Or let's at least have balance in the conversation and give the people the opportunity who are standing up in queues saying, we speak for country, but Don't the people in the far west coast, they've already got an experience, they've already seen the cancers, they've already seen the radiation poisoning. They can, there are still a lot of, they can tell you, you know, like it, it, it can't be discredited that they're the people who have an experience in Australia already, yet they're being largely more. <coughs> That's it, Bruce. Uh, the technology and that side of it is just a distraction away from the truth. And any of this supposed science is a furphy. If we look back historically at any narrative, things have changed and screwed up repeatedly. So essentially, if we don't protect country and we think that we're largely only facilitating this sort of utopian singular singularity dream of being cyborgs, we're essentially on the wrong path completely. We're losing our instinct for ourselves as humans. So we have to actually, that's why we're coming across with um, a listening ear to hear what it is that you have to say there, Bruce, and what people have to say about it. And that's, and it's not coming back for an Australian public to, to sort of gloat over it and then throw it down a hole. It's actually going out to an international um, listening ear as well. And they need to know what is actually happening here without some sort of media uh, disaggregation that's completely dis distrustful and, and, and full of lies and mistruths. It has to be actually spoken from the <coughs> work and heard from what you're and, and from what the um, people there are about to say. Alex, I'll be, I'll be bringing you a digital message stick that I will neither be writing or accountable to, but I'll be passing it on. That's this, message, this message is strong. This message is sound and, and treat it like the message stick of old. It's just a digital message stick that the people that I'm speaking with here want to pass on. And then that we pass that digital message stick on with all the rights and authorities of our message sticks. The message to be listened to and not misreported. The message to be sent to the people who need to hear it. And that's mm. the story. This is, this is what our people are saying here. And this is what we believe we need to be promoting is that there is strong voice in this space and and we're going there with our ears on and we're going to have a good old listen with them. 